Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you to uh, Nick and Xrite. It's great to be here today. And today we're going to have a look at tips and techniques for shooting ice and snow. Now I've had to unfortunately pre-record this. We had some uh, run into some bandwidth issues uh, between Australia and the US when we were testing for the uh, webinar, which means I had to pre-record this, but uh, we can still get through everything I wanted to cover. So, and hopefully I'll be uh, able to stay online and take some questions afterwards for anyone who might have any. So let's get into it. And <clears throat> for those who don't know me, my name is Joshua Hulko. I'm a professional landscape photographer and based in Australia, but I specialize in polar and subpolar photography, or what I call extreme latitudes of the globe. So I spend a lot of time doing photography in the Arctic, Antarctic, places such as Iceland, Greenland, Spitsbergen, uh, Norway, uh, even New Zealand and Tasmania, basically anywhere where there is snow and ice. And um, that means I need to travel a lot. So there's very little in the way of snow and ice in Australia. So I'm usually traveling three to five months of the year. Uh, and uh, I do run workshops and expeditions to other photographers to, to these places. And um, I do have a website. You can visit my website at www.jhulko.com or photographyexpeditions.com. And I have a blog, and the blog's probably the best way to stay up to date with what I'm doing at any given point in time. Um, my blog is at blog.jhulko.com. You can also find me in, on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Just do a search for Joshua Hulko, and you should find me. And you can find me on Nick Radio as well. Uh, I, because I am traveling three to five months of the year, and uh, if I'm not um, if I'm not that quick to respond, it just means I'm likely in an area that doesn't have internet access. But I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can. So let's just dive right in and have a look at what we're going to do today <clears throat> and what our agenda is. We're going to have a look at photographing images with snow and ice. And I'm going to talk very briefly before I start showing what my workflow is and how I process images about exposure and the importance of exposure when photographing snow and ice. We're going to have a look at uh, monitor profiling with the X-Rite i1 Display Pro. We're also going to have a look at camera calibration or creating camera profiles with the X-Rite Color Checker Passport and how I use the Color Checker Passport in my workflow uh, to really get the most from my images. Because I travel three to five months of the year, I'm time poor, which means I don't have a huge amount of time to process my files once I do get back to my studio. So I've I try and do as much as I can to get the image right in camera. And that's really something that I've always done Ever since I was learning the craft of photography, I used to shoot a lot of transparencies. And because the exposure latitude was so narrow with transparencies, half a stop either side of a correct exposure was either underexposed or overexposed, I learned to get the image right in camera. And that's something I still try and do today uh, as much as possible. And the Color Checker Passport really helps me to get my images closer to the finished result uh, with as little time as possible. So we're going to have a look at how I use that in my workflow. I'm going to show you the image, the image processing that I do in Adobe Lightroom. Um, pretty much from the moment I import the file till I hand it off to uh, one of the Nick software plugins, which is where I really do a lot of the optimization. It's really the secret source in getting the most from the image so that we have uh, what I like to call the two T's are important when photographing snow and ice, texture and tone. So we want to have both texture and tone in our snow so that there is interest there and it's not just a big flat white space and if you can get texture and tone into your snow and ice it will usually mean that you're going to end up with a good image or hopefully a good image <clears throat> so just talking briefly about photographing images with snow and ice in the field it's really important to have a get a good exposure and in order to get a good exposure, it's important to understand how your camera reads the scene. Now, the camera's meter will read in a given scene, any given scene, at 18% grey, which means if you point the camera at uh, a snowy scene, the camera's going to read that snow as grey and will underexpose it. And I'll talk in a minute about why that's um, not ideal and why we want to fix that as, as best we can in, in camera. What we want to do is expose to the right uh, on our camera's histogram and the reason we want to do that is the camera captures more data in the top right of the histogram than it does in the bottom left. And I'll show you an example of what I mean in just a moment. The easiest way I find to get a good exposure in the field for snow and ice is to set my camera to spot metering, uh, plus two stops. I usually link the spot meter to the autofocus point, uh, plus two stops or plus one and two third stops. Uh, and if you point the spot meter at the snow, you'll get a, you'll usually get, almost always get a perfect exposure uh, because we do want to avoid underexposure. And 
I'm just going to show an example of what I'm talking about now. This is an underexposed image. This is some uh, this is an image of some Icelandic horses that uh, I was photographing on my workshop in Iceland a couple of weeks ago, and I've just dragged down the exposure by two stops just to illustrate my point. If you can see here up on the histogram that the exposure is the histogram is biased towards the left. Now the way the camera's sensor captures data is not linear. That is to say, there is significantly more data that is captured in the top one third of the histogram than there is in the bottom one third. That's why when you have an underexposed image, such as what I have here, and you lift the shadows, you will often see noise in the shadows because the signal to noise ratio is much lower in the bottom part of the histogram. So we want to avoid images like this that are underexposed because they give us less data to work with. And when we're trying to get texture and tone into an image, it's really, really important to start with as much information as possible. Uh, to get the best out of the image. So this is an underexposed image and could have easily been avoided by spot metering off the snow here and that would have given us a correctly exposed image such as this one. Now this is um, this histogram here as you can see is biased towards the right so there's significantly more data captured in this image than was captured in the previous one. So this, this image is what I would like to call exposed to the right. Uh, it does require some work to bring out the best in this file still we have a much better starting point. Uh, although it might look that look like this snow in here is quite flat, there is all the detail and texture is in there. We just need to coax it out. And I'm going to show you how I do that in uh, both Lightroom and also in Nick software. Before we get into that, I just want to talk very quickly about the importance of monitor profiling. Now, the first step to ac accurate, predictable and repeatable color in, in your work environment is having a profile monitor. It's really the crux of which everything else stems from. In order to do that, I use an X-Rite i1 Display Pro, uh, which is a color limiter. You can see it there on the uh, laptop on screen. There, um, I use an NEC SpectreView 27 inch monitor in my studio here, and I'm calibrating to D6500, which is a known standard with a gamma of 2.2 at 130 candelas of brightness. Now, the X-Rite Color Checker Passport, uh, X-Rite um, i1 rather, comes with uh, software to drive it. It's very easy to use and you can set the standards that you want to calibrate to. The reason I'm calibrating to 130 candelas, which might seem a little bit low, is because that actually gives me the best screen to paper match when I'm making prints. So by the biggest complaint I often hear from people who start making prints uh, for the first time is that their prints are too dark. And the reason that their prints are too dark is that their monitor is actually too bright. And because it's a backlit device and a piece of paper is frontlit, it uh, has a much higher contrast ratio. So we need to drop the brightness down to better match the paper. So those are the settings that I use here in my studio. The other extra product I want to talk very briefly about is the Color Checker Passport and how the Color Checker Passport can really help get help you get the best from your particular camera um, and I'm going to illustrate that in just a moment in in Lightroom and how to use it. <clears throat> so those are the Xrite products that I use in my workflow and you can read more about them at xritephoto.com but for now let's just dive straight into um, having a look at uh, some images and talking about how I use the Color Checker Passport in my own workflow. The great thing about the Color Checker Passport is that you don't have to remember to take a photograph of it every time you shoot an image in the field. The lighting conditions that you shoot under um, in the field don't necessarily need to be replicated on the Color Checker Passport itself. Uh, this is an image of the Color Checker that I uh, shot here in my studio um, on my, under my graphic light workstation. It's shot under 5000 Kelvin degree lights and it's not even it's handheld with a 70 to 200 on the 1DX. As you can see, it's not even particularly, hopefully you can see on the webinar, it's not even particularly sharp, but that actually doesn't matter. The main thing is that I have a photograph of the, of the Color Checker Passport so that I can show you how to use it in the field. Sorry, how to use it in your workflow. So once I've imported the image into Adobe Lightroom, as I've done now, uh, what I'm going to do is use this image of the Passport to actually create a profile for my specific camera. And I'm just before I do that, I just want to talk about profiles and how to use them and what they are. So in the develop module in Lightroom, the, if you come down under the camera calibration tab, you'll see 
there are two options here. One is process and one is profile. The one we're interested in is profile. Now, this was shot with a Canon 1DX camera. And the rendering that we're seeing here on screen is what Adobe called their standard rendering for the Canon 1DX. That is, it's a rendering that Adobe created based on the 1DX camera they used um, when they created the profile. You'll also find in this uh, drop down tab a number of other uh, profile options, and these are also created by Adobe. And they are, in this case, they are uh, attempts to imitate uh, Canon's uh, picture, picture um, I think they call them picture profiles or picture. Um, uh, yeah, I think they're called picture profiles or something similar to that. And they have a number of them. And Adobe has attempted to, uh, which they apply to a JPEG in camera. And Adobe has attempted to give you uh, options for these here. So before I select that, let's just go back over to the grid view and talk about how we create a profile with our photograph of the passport. So once you've imported the file into Lightroom, you just simply come up under File, Export. And you export to, and once you, the Color Checker Passport comes with software. Once you've installed that software, you'll have an option that pops up here in the export dialog in Lightroom called x -Rite Presets. So we want to select that. We want to give our profile that we're going to create a name. So in this case, I'm going to simply call it the Canon 1DX profile. And you can create what's called a dual illuminate profile. That is, it's two images of the color checker passport that have been shot under different lighting conditions and averaged together. It's not relevant to what I'm doing with landscape photography, so I'm going to skip that for today. <clears throat> There's some information here about how to use a custom DNG profile. Uh, the x -Rite system actually tells me here that my monitor is profiled, and I simply would now go ahead and hit export. Once I've hit export, X the x -Rite software will create the profile in the background, and we'll need to restart Lightroom. Once I've restarted Lightroom, uh, I can then come back in and I'm going to just illustrate now what the differences are and I will see my option down here for the Canon 1DX. So what we're looking at at the moment is the Adobe standard rendering for the Canon 1DX that they used when the um, when they created their rendering. It's not, my it's not specific to my camera, it was Adobe's camera. The profile that we've created now is specific to my camera and hopefully on this webinar as I flip between these two you'll be able to see the difference so uh, as you can see the colors here are a little bit flat and muted under the Adobe standard rendering but when I select the profile I created the colors change and they're far richer and more vibrant more saturated and the reason for that is simply because the profile is specific to my individual camera uh, it's a more accurate rendering of the color from my camera rather than using uh, a, the rendering that Adobe had for the Canon 1DX they created. So I'm just going to flick back and forth again between these. So hopefully you can see the difference on screen. So that's the Adobe standard rendering for the 1DX they used. And this is the rendering for the 1DX um, for my own cam camera 1DX. And importantly, I can apply this profile to images that other images that I've shot so and get these enhanced color which means it's going to save me time in post-production to bring out this color because I can use this profile so let's I've got a number of images here so I'm going to just start with this one which is a photograph of Godafoss waterfall this is which is Icelandic this waterfall is found in the north of Iceland and Godafoss is Icelandic for waterfall of the gods and this particular waterfall, this was shot just over two weeks ago now in, in Iceland and during winter <clears throat> between my two workshops. And um, this is the raw file as, um, as imported into Lightroom. I'm just going to go down here and hit the reset button so you can see this is literally the, the raw file imported into Lightroom. And I'm going to run through the workflow that I would use to process this, this photograph. So the very first thing I would do after coming into the develop module is to select the profile that I want to apply um, to this image. Now, uh, it was shot with the Canon 1DX and this is a good illustration of how I can use an image shot with the Color Checker Passport after the, after the fact that was shot. In fact, the actual Color Checker Passport was photographed here in my studio, whereas this image was shot in Lightroom and I can apply that profile and it's going to give me a far more accurate rendering of the color that was captured by my camera. 
but hopefully you can see that on screen the colors has just become more saturated and more vibrant i'll just flick between them again so that's the adobe standard rendering and this is the rendering for my own camera the 1dx and importantly um, these profiles that you create with the color checker passport they are camera specific so if you're shooting with multiple cameras you're going to need to shoot the color checker passport with each camera um, so make sure that you have a when it creates the profile it will create it for that particular camera and will appear here in the drop down list for you <clears throat> they are also ISO specific so if you're shooting images at varying ISO it's worthwhile to shoot the color checker passport at the same ISOs so that you'll find that the color rendering does change slightly between cameras and between ISOs. So in my case, this image was shot at ISO 100 and the color checker passport was also shot at ISO 100. So that's really the first step for me in, in processing an image and it's a quick and easy step to get uh, a, a more accurate rendering of the color that was um, that was captured by my camera sensor. After I've done that, I'll come up to the top of the develop panel and I would generally work from top to bottom. Um, although I'm not uh, I'm not a slave to that, I will occasionally jump around a little bit. Um, but generally I'll work from top to bottom. And the first thing after selecting camera profile that I like to do is to literally hit the auto button in the, um, in the basic panel. And I do that just to see what, uh, what what it does to the image and often it will give me a much better starting point um, as it has in this case so we can see if I just undo that again you can see that the histogram is a, this is a good exposure I've got a good uh, good range of tones from the brightest area in the histogram right across to almost the darkest area and hitting the auto button is just going to optimize that and just spread those tones just a little more uh, it's going to look the snow is going to look a little flat in areas but we'll be able to fix that uh, and and bring some texture and tone into these, these 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 wide areas. Now, after I've hit the auto button, I just like to come through and just fine tune these adjustments. I'm happy with the exposure and I'm more or less happy with contrast for the moment. But what I do want to do to help bring some uh, to just bring down these bright white areas is I'm just going to drag down the highlight slider. And this is a fabulous tool that's appeared in Lightroom. Uh, I think it was in the last version that we saw it appear because it's very difficult to do this with a curve um, to affect one particular area of an image like this without leaving a flat spot on the curve uh, in other areas. So the highlight slider is one that I use a lot when I'm shooting snow and ice. And in this case, I'm actually going to drag it all the way down to minus 100. Now, if I just reset that, uh, hopefully you can see what that's actually doing to, this, to the image. It's actually pulling down those highlights and I am picking up some detail that was that was previously lost up here, so it's it's a worthwhile adjustment to make. And now there are still some areas that need uh, quite a bit of work, but uh, that has been a really good first step. The next two things I like to do is, in this case, I'm not going to adjust my shadows. I'm happy with 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 my shadows. If I wasn't and I wanted to lift them a little bit, I could, but I'm happy with my shadows in this image. So the next thing I want to do is just set my white points and black points. And that is going to be what is the brightest and what is the darkest uh, part of the image. Now, the easiest way to do that and the way I like to do that is to hold down the option key uh, on, a, on a Mac. And if you hold down the option key and click on it, you can actually see if I bring that up when it's starting to clip. So what I like to do is just I'll bring that back down just until I haven't got any clipping or just a tiniest bit of clipping. Which is about there and then do the same for the blacks so there's actually a little more clipping there in the blacks than i would like so i'm just going to bring that up just a fraction okay now <clears throat> with once i've set those i'll then have a look at white balance now white balance for me is a creative tool i'm much more interested in pleasing color than i am necessarily in accurate color uh, when I'm shooting landscape in nature and it was a very cold morning when I shot this sh shot this scene and it was actually quite the story to make this photograph and if anyone's interested I, ha I have the uh, I have the story of this image on my blog and um, it almost didn't happen and we had wandered out to this to the waterfall from the car park in, in what was fresh deep snow the light was very blue um, and it was early morning and it was I really like the feeling that's been captured in the image now if I was to neutralize that 
um, by selecting white here and just neutralizing this, um, which may be an accurate rendering of, of the color of snow, it's going to remove the feeling of the image, uh, as you can see. And that feeling of being cool and cold is completely gone. So white balance for me is not so much about accurate, being accurate as it is about being pleasing. So I'm going to undo that. Uh, and adjust it by eye rather than trusting what uh, the white balance tool says is accurate. And now to do that, I'm, I know from experience that shooting with the Canon 1DX that generally the auto white balance is extremely accurate. However, it is, it is often just a fraction cooler than I would like. So I'm just going to warm this up just a hair. Um, I'm still going to keep that feeling of cool and blue in the image, but I'm just going to warm up my white balance just a fraction. And if I want to see a quick before and after, I can just click on the before and after preview. And as you can see, I haven't done a huge amount to this image in terms of view of the look of the image. Uh, it's not that dissimilar to where I started, but I'm just starting to get texture and tone uh, into the snow and to get the image into more of a finished state. So the next step for me is at this point is to add a gradient to the sky. Now, when I shot this, I shot this with a three stop soft uh, neutral density graduated filter to help bring down the sky. But because I have now uh, made some changes here in the in the basic panel uh, to exposure and contrast, I need to just bring that sky down a little bit. So I'm just going to apply a grad gradient filter. That's too much. Let's just say minus two thirds of a stop. And we don't need to do that. So in fact, that may be a little too much still. So we'll just drag that down. So minus, say half a stop. And really what I'm doing here is just making sure that I'm going to have the right tonalities in the sky as I remember it from the day I shot it because the sky was not super bright. Uh, and we had very soft diffuse light with like a scrim effect through the cloud. So I've applied my gradient and while I'm here in the sky, I'm just going to clean up this dust bunny. And also this one down here as well. As they're distracting. Okay, so I'm now going to work down to the presence tab. Now, when I'm applying clarity, vibrance and saturation to an image, it's important to understand that Lightroom is applying these globally. Uh, although these the changes that Lightroom makes are not directly altering the pixels, these changes are, are um, affecting the entire image. So I need to be careful with how I use them. Uh, they're not local corrections. But I do want to apply just a little bit of clarity. And the reason I want to do that, clarity is really local contrast. And the reason that I want to do that is I just want to restore the softening that um, was added to the image from the camera's anti-aliasing filter when this was shot. And a little bit of clarity um, is typically the best way to do that. And from experience, I know shooting with my Canon cameras that somewhere around 10 to 20 points of clarity is a good amount of clarity to add as a starting point. It's not a lot. Um, it's just enough to remove that softening um, from the anti-aliasing filter. Uh, when it comes to vibrance and saturation for the image, uh, vibrance is actually going to affect the most desaturated colors in this image first. Now this image is all about blue and different tones and shades of blue. So what I'll probably find is that by increasing vibrance, I'm just going to throw 15 points of vibrance in there. It's going to affect primarily this area here and here visually, but it certainly also affected the blue in the other areas of the image as well. And again, 15 points is usually I find enough to just restore the color that was lost um, uh, during the image capture. Uh, I tend not to use saturation. Saturation for me is a little bit of a blunt tool. Um, I would prefer to do that, uh, do my saturation in, in the Nick plugins at a later date. Uh, I don't intend to do much with the tone curve here in this instance or um, any of these particular, any of the saturation or luminance adjustments either. I'll then come down and I'll sharpen the image. Now, when I'm sharpening an image in Lightroom, what I'm really interested in is, is the capture sharpening. Sharpening is a three-stage process for me. I have capture sharpening, creative sharpening, and my output sharpening. Output sharpening is going to be specific to 
the particular needs, whether I'm making a print or sending an image to the web or uh, for a book or whatever the case may be, it's going to need specific sharpening for that output. But here, what we're interested in at the moment is creative sharpening, is sorry, is capture sharpening. And really it's about restoring again, the softness to the image that's brought about by the camera's anti-aliasing filter um, and just bringing back some, some, some crunch to the image. Now, the way I like to do that is I like to do a before and after zoom into 100% and I'm going to zoom in on um, these icicles here on the right hand side because there's a huge amount of fine detail in here that's going to really give me an opportunity to to see how the sharpening sliders are affecting the image. Now when I'm sharpening, sharpening in Lightroom is applying is applied to the luminance channel. That is it's, it's not affecting the color in the image. So if we hold down the option key and then drag our slider it's actually going, we can actually see what the image looks like in black and white. And this is a really good way to, to be able to better see what's going on with sharpening in the image. And I'm just going to set that to about 55, which again, just from experience, I know is about the right amount for the Canon 1DX with this type of file. Um, now, when it comes to setting the radius, the radius is really looking at how many pixels either side of an edge are going to be affected. And the higher the frequency, uh, the image, that is the more detail, fine detail in the image, the lower the radius you're generally going to want to have. Uh, you can see this again, just by holding down the option key and clicking on radius, you can see as I drag this up, hopefully you can see this on the webinar, how it's affecting the image. So this is quite a, there's quite a lot of high frequency information in here. So I'm going to set this to a radius of about 0.8 for my sharpening. And then detail, I'm going to just run detail up to about, again, around about 55. And that is just applied, as you hopefully see, again, hopefully you can see this in the before and after here. It's just restored um, some sharpness to the image and just made it a, a, a look a little bit crisper. And <clears throat> before I finish in the sharpening tab, uh, what I want to do now is, I don't need this uh, before and after preview anymore or to zoom out what i want to do now is just apply a little bit of masking now most images can benefit from having a little bit of masking applied when it comes to sharpening and what that's going to do is just prevent certain areas of the image from being sharpened so say these areas up in the sky here where there's no real detail um, but adding sharpening to it will create noise so again just holding down the option key on my mac i can click on the slider and just drag it up to see what I'm affecting. So any areas that are white are being affected by sharpening. So I'm going to set this at around about, just at around about eight points where it's, it's just, it's really hitting the edges of, and not hitting the big flat open areas for sharpening. And that's capture sharpening in a nutshell. Uh, this image was shot at ISO 100 on the 1DX, so there's no noise reduction that I need to apply to this image. But the one thing I am going to do, and I do this with virtually every image is just, remove the hit the automatic remove chromatic aberration now this was shot with the 24 mil tilt shift canon lens which means there's actually very little in the way of chromatic aberration if any in that lens but it's a free lunch so i may as well um, take advantage of it coming down further i don't want to apply any vignetting to this image but and that's the last one i need to look at so in terms of processing this is all i would actually do to this file in lightroom and if I'd gone through and done this um, uh, at the normal speed, it probably would have taken me at the most one to two minutes to, to process this file. And if I can do a quick before and after, and you can hopefully see um, hopefully see the differences between these, these two images um, from when the image was imported into Lightroom to the changes that I've made in the develop module to where I'm happy with the image. Now, at this point, a lot of people might be happy with the um, this photograph, but we can actually do a lot more to, um, to to this image to really make it sing. So what I'm going to do is take it over to, to Nick. Don't need that before and after preview. And to do that, I'm just going to do photo, edit in, edit in Adobe Photoshop. And we'll just jump over into Photoshop. Okay, so here we have the processed file uh, from, from Adobe Lightroom, and we're now in Photoshop. Now to get into Nick, 
um, you go into filter, Nick software, Nick filters. Now I have the complete suite here installed in, in, in Photoshop, Color Effects, Define, HDR, uh, Sharpener Pro 3, Silver Effects and Viveza 2. In this instance, I'm going to look at Color Effects Pro and Viveza 2. Nick really gives us a toolbox um, of things that we can use to process our images. And the important thing is to understand what tool to use when to get the most from your image. So I'm going to take this image into Color Effects Pro 4 and show what I would do to this image to really get the most out of it. Okay, so here we are in Color Effects Pro 4 with the image as it's as it was processed in Lightroom. Now, what I'm going to do is the way I've got this set up at the moment is just with the before and after, so that as I drag this slider across, you'll be able to see the changes that I'm making to the image. Now, in, there are a huge number of filters here in Color Effects Pro 4, and we're not going to certainly not going to look at all of them today. We are going to look at the ones that interest me in the most and that I use for processing snow and ice, and those two are Detail Extractor and Tonal Contrast. And we're going to start in this case with tonal contrast. Now, each one of these um, Nick filters has a range of standard defaults that you can um, you can apply to an image. So, if you need to process an image super quickly and you haven't got time to go through and do it manually, you can apply a number of these different um, uh, presets. However, I like to process my images on an individual basis. So what I'm going to do is show you how I use this particular filter, Tonal Contrast, to really get the most out of the image. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this filter on, and it's going to turn on at default. That is the settings that I last used uh, when I bought this image, um, when I processed an image in, in Color Effects with this filter. So what I'm going to do, because I like to start from a clean slate, is I have a recipe which I've previously created called um, Zero Starting Point. And what that is is just the yes. What that is is just t applying the filter tonal contrast, but with all of my sliders set to zero, so that I can see exactly what they're doing. And in order to be able to illustrate this as best as possible, I'm going to just drag the before and after over to about here, so that you can see as I move these sliders around what it's actually doing to the image, because it's this is um, this is really important to getting texture and tone into our snow, and this image still needs uh, some work to make them make it really sing. The easiest way to actually do this and to see how the highlights affect the image, sorry, see how each slider affects the image, is to literally come in and just drag the slider over to 100%. And you can see that it's affecting the highlights in the image uh, and what it's doing. Now, that's obviously far too strong. And if I drag this around, you can see the before and the after. Now, that's obviously far too strong, but it's going to give me a better understanding of what uh, is being affected when I move by this particular slider. So I'm going to just drag this back now into something that looks more along the lines of what I might use somewhere around about there. It's moving the before and after slider. So what I'm looking for is just subtlety. I want to get texture and tone into the snow, but I don't want to overdo it. So I'm happy with that. And the same goes for the mid-tones. If I drag that all the way up to 100, I can just see exactly what's being affected. There's actually a dust bunny up there I missed. I can see exactly what's being affected in the image. So it's affecting the mid-tones in the, in the snow and ice. And it's also, there's a lot of mid-tones here in the water as well. Um, again, this is obviously far too strong. So I'm just going to drag it back until I get it roughly where I want it to be. Again, just using the before and after. And I'm particularly looking at these areas of, of snow and icicles up in here. But also up in these back mountains, you can see just up in here how, how that's improving the image by adjusting that mid-tone slider. Okay, I'm happy with that. And then the sh lastly, the shadows. So again, I'm just going to drag this over here so we can see that's really affecting these dark areas of the image. And again, that's obviously far too much. So I'm just going to drag it back down. And it really doesn't need much at all in the shadows because there's already quite a bit of contrast in here. And if I create too much, what it's going to do is draw the eye to this area of the image. And I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to set this very subtly somewhere around about there. I'll just check it now. Yeah, it's just putting a little, again, you may not be able to see this, but it's just very subtle, subtly creating a little bit more um, uh, contrast in this area of the image. 
Okay. Now, I'm obviously just using the um, the wipe here to show you before and after, but you can actually do a side-by-side -side preview. Um, I find it more useful to do a wipe. Uh, and probably on this webinar, it's going to be too hard to see this way. So I'm just going to go back to that split preview. <clears throat> now, this particular filter also gives us a saturation option. The problem with using saturation here in this filter is, again, it's going to affect this image globally, which I don't really want to do. I want to affect this image purely um, when it comes to saturation. I want to be able to target my saturation so that I'm not sending all of this snow a deep blue in color. So I'm going to leave that set at zero for now. And what I am going to do is add an additional filter uh, at this point. So I'm going to click on add filter because I'm very happy with what's going on up here now with texture and tone in this snow. Uh, I've restored, really restored. And again, I'm just going to drag this back over again so you can see the before. I'm really happy with how much texture and tone we've managed to get into this, but keeping the image looking like it was when I, when, I, when I was there and photographed it. But I do want to fix this area down here, which I think could still use a little bit of work. And to do that, I'm going to use the detail extractor. So I'm finished with tonal contrast. So I'm literally just going to click on add filter, come back over to my filter list. And to detail extractor, and I'm just going to click on the default for the moment, which is going to apply detail extractor at the default settings. And the first thing I'm going to do is just literally come in and just reset those to zero. So I'm working from a clean slate. <clears throat> now, I also want to, um, the way I want to do this is if I was just to start moving these sliders, I would actually start applying the effect to the entire image, which I don't want to do. I really am only interested at the moment in this, this snow down here. I'm very happy with the uh, texture and tone in the rest of the image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a control point to just affect this part of the image down here. I'll click on add control point and touch it on the snow there. Now, if I want to see what's being affected here uh, by that control point, I can just click on this button here for the control point and that will actually show the mask that Nick has created on the fly. Now I could have done this in Photoshop with uh, by creating a new layer uh, and creating a mask, but Nick does it so fast that it's so much easier for me to just come in here and do it in a Nick filter um, as opposed to spending half an hour to an hour to building a, a mask specific to this adjustment. So what I'm doing here, as you can see, is as I increase this, it's affecting more and more of the image. So I just want to drag it down until I'm just affecting this particular part of the image and somewhere around about there is fine. Um, <clears throat> once I've done that, I'll just turn that off so that you can see the image again. Then what I'm going to do is just run up my detail extractor. And what that's going to do is it's really going to, it's only going to affect this particular part of the image. But what it's going to do is it's really going to bring in some texture. And again, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on this webinar because this is a very subtle adjustment. But certainly what it's done is add a lot more texture to the to the snow down in this area and again i'm just going to put some contrast in here too so that hopefully you can make it a little bit easier to see so we, over there we have here we have before and i'm looking particularly particularly at this area down here in the left here which is where i'm affecting and after so really what i've done there is add a lot more texture to this snow so that it's no longer a flat white expanse but there's now detail in that snow uh, and once I've done that, uh, I'm happy with the image. So I can simply hit OK. And Nick will now apply those filters as a separate layer in Photoshop, which it's doing now. And the great thing about having it applied as a separate layer in Photoshop is that if I uh, have overdone the effect and it's too strong, I can actually reduce it. I can simply come in here, reduce the opacity on that effect by whatever amount I want to turn it down. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to be able to just bring it down if you've overdone it. And again, I can just click that on and off. And you can see the difference. So there's the image as we finished in Lightroom and there's the finished image after we've done with it in Nick, in the Nick Color Effects Pro. 
There's one more thing I'd like to do to this image to really make it pop and sing and to absolutely get the most out of it. And to do that, I'm going to go into another Nick plugin, which is Viveza 2. And again, because Nick's created this as a, this the last filter as a complete new layer, I can simply go filter, Nick software, Viveza 2, and it will give me, it will start another new layer for me to work on, uh, I'll work on the image. So again, I've got my, let me just go ahead and enlarge this full screen for you and just drag my before and after slider over to the left. Now I spoke earlier about how I generally don't like to use the saturation tool in Lightroom because it's a blunt instrument. And I also don't like to use it in, um, uh, in Color Effects Pro either because it's applying saturation to the entire image. And really what I'm interested in is targeting areas of my image. And I'm going to show you what I, how I do that in Viveza, using Viveza 2. The first thing I'm going to do is at a control point. And the area that I'm interested in affecting here is the water. So I'm going to click on the water to drop a control point. And the first thing I'm going to do is just have a look at and see exactly what I'm affecting. And you can see here that I'm affecting the, all this area of the water, but I'm also affecting the, the areas of the water up in here as well, which is exactly what I want. So Nick has very cleverly built this built a mask on the fly that I could have built in Photoshop, but would have taken me probably probably half an hour to an hour to build that mask. And Nick's done it with a single click. So this is a huge time saver for me, uh, particularly when I come home from a, a shoot overseas from somewhere like Iceland, I can come back with anywhere between 3,000 and 15,000 images. So uh, anything that saves me time when I'm processing my files is of great benefit. So I can see the area that I want to affect here and I'm affecting it with that control point. And I literally just want to come up here and I'm going to just run up saturation and I'm going to overdo the effect. Again, so you can see it's only affecting this part of the image. And I'm just going to drag my before and after slider over here so that you can see the difference. Now I've obviously overdone that just, just to see, so you can just illustrate my point that I'm only affecting the water. So I'm just going to drag that back now to somewhere where I'd like it to be. And that's just around about there. So what I'm doing is just, this image is really all about this flowing water. So what I want to do is really emphasize the beautiful aquamarine color of this water, which is why I'm adding a little bit of saturation to it here. And that's probably just a little too much still. Because I might, again, I might want the effect to be subtle. I don't want to overdo it. So uh, I'm not interested in in, uh, in garish colors, but I want to make it, again, just, just subtle. Okay. So I'm happy with that. I can literally just come in and hit OK. And that's now going to apply that, um, uh, the Viveza 2 uh, adjustment as a separate as a separate layer. So I can literally come in and just turn that layer on and off. And again, it's a subtle adjustment, so I hope you can see this. But it's just applying that saturation to the to the water area. And it's also picked up these beautiful green parts of the falls. So I'm just going to show you. So here's the original image now. As it came into Photoshop, processed in Lightroom, it, it's, it looks good, but there was obviously there was more that could be done. So, and then here's the finished image with the adjustments that we made in Nick. And hopefully you can see that it's a significant improvement and very, very quick and easy to do. And had I been doing that at, uh, at the normal speed, I probably would have finished this image from import into Lightroom uh, with the adjustments I made in Lightroom, plus the adjustments that I've made in Nick, in probably no more than two or three minutes. So very, very fast, very powerful, and a great way to work on images to bring out the, the texture and the tone in the snow and ice. So let's put that image aside and just jump back into Lightroom and have a look at something a little bit different. Uh, hopefully I've got time to do a couple more. We'll just see how we go. I'm going to have a look at this image. This is um, this is a photograph I made in uh, Iceland also a couple of weeks ago. It was up on one of the glaciers in the south of Iceland. And it's just beautiful shape and tone to um, to the ice on the glacier, almost like waves. And uh, I shot this with um, with the, the Canon 1DX and the 70-200 with a 1.4 extender on it. And what, what drew me to this was really the, it's more of an abstract, oops, it's more of an abstract type of image, but it, what really drew me to this was the, the shape and the texture. There's beautiful texture and the tone in this ice, and we can certainly bring that out. So let's just jump over to the develop module. And um, 
I'm going to process this image. I'm going to move a little bit more quickly than I did on the last one because I've already covered off how and why I do some of the things that I do when I'm processing an image. Just the very first thing again that I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to my camera calibration tab and I'm going to apply uh, the 1DX camera profile that I created so that's specific for my camera. And you'll be able to see straight away that the image is bluer. And that's because the color is more saturated in the profile that I've created. So it's giving me a better starting point for my photograph. Once I've done that, I'm going to come back up to the um, basic panel and just click on auto. And what auto has done here is go through and try and really to what it, what it thinks is the best way to um, optimize this particular image. In this case, it's a little bit overdone. So I'm going to just drag back the contrast a little bit and just drag up my exposure. It's a little bit too much. And the reason it's dragged down the exposure here is the image was actually exposed to the right. So I wanted to capture as much data as I possibly could. Uh, I'm also going to drag down my highlights again. This is a very, very powerful way um, in Lightroom to affect the highlights without affecting other parts of the image. Now, if I was to do that with a curve down here in the tone curve, I would end up with a flat spot in my midtones. And um, what that would mean is it, uh, adversely affecting the midtones for the sake of the highlights. Whereas if I do it up here, it allows me to affect just the highlights without affecting the midtones. Um, I'm just going to then quickly go through and set my white clipping point. And by holding down the option key so I can see what I'm doing with clipping and also my black clipping point and you can see it's just clipping down there in the left so I'm just going to bring that up a couple of points to about there okay now I'm actually happy with the the default white balance for this image uh, as I said earlier white balance is a creative tool for me so I'm not interested in what is technically correct I'm interested in what is um, visually aesthetic to my eye and I'm happy with the with the standard rendering for white balance i'm going to again just apply a little bit of clarity to remove some of the softness and the anti-aliasing filter and also just a little bit of vibrance and that's pretty much all i'm going to do the image this image up here and if i do a quick before and after preview hopefully you can see what a difference just those few changes uh, that i've made here in the develop module have made to this image they're quite dramatic <clears throat> moving down um, our develop panel I'm just going to quickly come in and sharpen the image. Again, I'm just literally, this is capture sharpening. It's just removing the inherent softness that is created from the camera's sensors having an anti-aliasing filter. And I just like to hold down again, I'd like to do it before and after so I can see the effect. And I'm just going to select this image in here, this particular part of the image in here where there's a lot of fine textural detail. I'm going to hold down the option key so that I'm going to so can see the luminance channel only. And I'm just going to drag up my slider. Again, just from experience, I know somewhere around about 50 to 60 points is going to be ideal for this particular camera. Now, there's a lot of very fine high frequency detail um, in this ice. And I really want to make sure that that's what I'm sharpening. So in this particular instance, I'm going to drag down my radius to probably 0 0.6, I think. Hopefully you can see this. It's just picking up more detail here. Um, than it was at a higher radius, so it's a better it's a better choice. And again, I'm just going to run my detail slider up again, somewhere around 55 points to affect. That's really the volume of how much it's going to it's going to apply. Okay. Once I've done that, I'm just going to again almost universally I will apply a little bit of masking to an image just to mask off sharpening areas that um, don't don't require it now in this particular image there's not much because there's there's textual detail pretty much from corner to corner so I'm just gonna have a very quick look what it's affecting when I start dragging the mask up uh, yeah it's very quickly it's going to start masking off detail so in this instance I'm not going to apply a mask to this image and again, just because it is a free lunch to, to remove chromatic aberration, there's no negative effect of applying this, um, this setting in develop, I'm going to do it. In fact, I normally would do this on import so that I don't even need to check this box here. And <clears throat> that's all I'm going to do to this image. So in, in Lightroom, so there's my before, how the image was shot. And I always shoot raw. So the raw images are a little flat and need to have some work. So here's the image, the raw images originally shot. 
and here's with the develop adjustments I've made in Lightroom and it's a as you can see it's a significant improvement already but there is a lot more that we can do to this image to really make it sing and to do that I'm going to take it over to Photoshop and to the Nick plugin so we'll go edit edit in Adobe Photoshop and to just jump over to Photoshop and the image is just loading up now okay so here we are in Photoshop with our processed file from Adobe Lightroom and what I'm going to do now is jump back into into one of the Nick plugins I'm going to go back into color effects pro 4 and uh, have a look at how we really bring out all of this beautiful texture and tone that's in this ice here because this is really a bit of an abstract image for me but there's so much beauty in this ice that I really want to bring it out um, because that this image is, is about texture and tone so we'll jump into color effects pro 4 and I'm just going to bring my before and after a little bit over to the left now again this is applied uh, total contrast default that is the last settings that uh, I used on that image for Godafoss the uh, frozen waterfall they are not specific to this image per se so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply that recipe I have previously created rather than going through and manually zeroing out uh, all of these sliders I can just quickly click on my recipe and apply a zero uh, which means that the image now is had no adjustments here in color effects and then we'll do those adjustments manually that are specific to this image. Now, if I had um, half a dozen or more images, perhaps that were all shot of this ice, and I wanted to apply the same adjustments, I could create a recipe here in Color Effects Pro 4 for this particular filter so that I could automatically apply that to each image, uh, which again, is just a real time saving device to be able to do that. So, again, I'll just drag this over a little bit more so you can better see the before better see the before and after and what I'm doing um, the very first thing I always like to do is just slider by slider I'm going to just literally drag it to 100% so that I can see hopefully you can see on the webinar here exactly the areas of the image that it's being affected as you can see it's mostly it is the highlights and obviously again this, the effect is too strong by having done that but I can see what's being affected and then just drag it back until I get the effect that I'm after now with highlights it, it's, it's very easy to overdo it so I need to be subtle with the effect because if I do ever do it, the image will become too crunchy. And so I'm mostly looking in this area here where there's a lot of highlights. And this is actually a problem area that we're going to need to fix. And we'll do that, we'll do that a little bit later in Viveza. So again, hopefully you can see that the effect's very subtle. I'm just going to drag it up just a little bit more um, for my highlight side. And then I'm going to look, move to my mid-tones. Uh, and again, I'll just drag it up to 100. So you can see that's obviously way, way too much sort of a HDR type effect, but it just shows the areas of the image that are being affected so that I know when I'm dragging the slider back down where I need to be looking to get the effect that I'm after. And that's it right there. Now I'm just going to slide my before and after over so that you can see just a little flat before was when I've applied those two adjustments. It's really brought out a lot of the texture and I'm looking particularly down in here uh, it's really brought out a lot of the texture and the tone in, in this in this beautiful ice. Okay, and we'll just have a look at shadows as well. The shadows is probably going to hit these very dark areas and overdo the image, uh, overdo the effect. But we'll just have a look. Yeah, it's definitely definitely going to target those just those very specific dark areas, and I definitely don't want to do that because it's going to create the make the image look far too crunchy. I do want to apply some effect, but not too much. So I'm just going to again make it very subtle. Just dragging my before and after across so that you can see the effect here um, on the ice. And that's actually still a little bit too strong. Let's drag that down to about there. Because again, it's about being subtle. It's about not overdoing it. Anytime you are working with snow and ice, it's very important not to overdo the effect. Uh, the moment you do, the image will start to look fake. Um, and if you don't do enough of it, um, you obviously not have any texture or tone and the image will look flat. So it's a very fine line when you're processing snow and ice uh, to get it right. And again, I don't want to apply any saturation because that's going to affect the image globally, um, which in this case might be okay because this image is actually all about blue. But before I do that, uh, I want to fix this particular highlight here, which is just too strong and it's just drawing my eye um, away from 
some of this beautiful texture and tone up to this this hot highlight here so I'm going to do that in Viveza but just before I jump to Viveza I want to go back into my detail extractor and just see if I can bring out some more of this texture really emphasize it uh, because that's really what this image is about so I'm just going to click on that filter and again this is just applied the default um, settings for when I was last here so I'm just going to quickly reset reset those so that we're working with a blank slate of detail extraction. <clears throat> okay. So sliding my before and after is now showing me the tonal contrast, the application of tonal contrast only, and detail extractor is not doing anything because it's been zeroed. So I'm just going to bring up the detail slider. And again, I'll just bring it up and overdo it so that you can see what that's, hopefully you can see that I'll bring it right up so that you can see how it's affecting the image. It's obviously far too strong, but you can see how it's just bringing out all this texture. Uh, it's really local contrast on a very fine level. Um, and so I'm going to bring that back down. And again, I want this to be a, I want this to be subtle. Uh, I don't want to overdo this effect. So I'm only going to apply 10 points. In fact, that actually maybe even a fraction too much, just a little less, and just a little bit of contrast. Okay, so here we have our image um, before as it came into color effects, and here we have it with the effects that we've applied. And I actually think looking at that now that those are a fraction too strong, but I'm going to leave them as they are because I can easily reduce the opacity in, in Photoshop. And I'm going to hit OK. And it's just going to apply that filter uh, those footer and adjustments as a new layer in Photoshop. Just just saving out now. Okay, so here it is. Here's the image as it came into Photoshop from Lightroom, and here it is with the effects applied. Now it's actually too strong. I've overdone it a little bit, so I'm just going to drag down the opacity on those changes to 50%. So that you can see there's my before and there's my after. Now, the only thing I want to do to this image to really finish it is to fix this hot highlight here. And to do that, I'm going to jump back into Nick into Viveza 2 because I can very quickly hit target just that particular area of the image. Uh, I'm going to drop a control point on that particular spot and just make sure, again, I'm just going to hit the mask um, option so that I can see what I'm affecting. And I'll just move that uh, before out of the way. So I can see that now by just reducing the size that I'm really targeting just this particular hot highlight, which is exactly what the area that I want to hit. And what I'm going to do is just take a little bit of brightness out of that spot and a little bit of contrast out as well. Just so that I'm really, my eye is no longer drawn to that hot spot so before and after, again, it's a subtle adjustment. If I were to overdo this, I would very quickly end up with the area looking gray. So I don't want to overdo it. I just want the effect to be to be subtle. Okay. Now, in <clears throat> having done that, I've just noticed that my eye is now also being drawn up here to the left, where it's not a super hot spot, but um, it could just be darkened down a fraction. Now, I could drop another control point on here and, and do this, but a really, really quick and easy way to do that is to duplicate this control point by hitting the duplicate button here and just dragging it up to that particular area of the image. And that's just going to darken down that corner a little bit. Uh, in fact, I quite like what that's doing. So I'm actually going to duplicate it again and drag it over to this bottom right hand corner of the image as well. So almost applying like a vignette type effect to the image, but using control points to do so. And what that's going to do is just help draw my eye in. I'm just going to put one in each corner. Just help draw my eye in to, um, to this beautiful texture and tone that's here in the ice. And that's all I'm going to do to this image in this case. Um, I haven't hit any additional saturation to this image. Uh, I really don't think that it needs it. By increasing the um, tonal contrast in this image, we've act by default um, in an, and in effect, we've increased saturation. So I'm going to hit OK. 
and that's now going to apply that as a uh, as a separate layer in Photoshop there we go so here's the image as it came into Photoshop from Lightroom with the Lightroom adjustments that we made and here's the finished image with the adjustments that we made in Vervasor 2 and Color Effects Pro 4 and hopefully you can see how much more texture and tone uh, has been added to this ice uh, through some very very quick simple adjustments uh, and as I said this is more of an abstract image for me but this this image is really all about um, this beautiful uh, texture in this ice and um, though using Color Effects Pro 4 and Vervasor 2 we can really um, dig down and emphasize and target those areas that we want to affect. So that's that's it for today. Uh, we're unfortunately I've, I've run out of time. In fact, I may even have run a, run a little over. But uh, hopefully that's given you um, a, an insight into how I process my files and the reasons that I use the uh, filters that I do. They're very quick time saving um, ways to process your files and to really maximize and get the most out of images with snow and ice because as I say it's all about texture and tone um, provided you've got a good exposed image so it's been exposed to the right uh, and you can you've got plenty of data to work with you can then really coax out all of that detail and really make your images sing and lift them to another level so I hope that's been of some help and I'm going to hopefully I'm still going to be on the line to answer any questions anyone may have and um, again, just want to say thank you to Nick. Thank you to x -Rite. Thanks, Brenda and Laurie. It's been great to be here today, and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.